It's wonderful to be here worshiping with all of you today. And I know some of you have been traveling. If you've been traveling, don't worry. You can catch up today. Over the last several weeks, we've been looking uh, at stories in the Bible, stories of extraordinary heroes. But the heroes we've been looking at aren't the usual heroes. We haven't looked at David, who fights battles and who unites the kingdom. And we haven't looked at Moses, who wields God's extraordinary power in his staff and who leads the people to freedom. And we haven't looked at Daniel, who survives a time in the lion's den through his faith and his prayer. No, this month we're focusing on some lesser-known heroes, some unsung heroes. These are ordinary people who do extraordinary things, not because of their power or their prestige or their position, but because of the strength of their character and the depth of their love. And all of the heroes we're looking at this month are women. Woohoo! Yay! So this week we're turning to the story of Naomi and of Ruth, which is told in the Old Testament book of Ruth. How many of you have read the book of Ruth from beginning to end? Yay, that's so many of you. If you haven't had the chance to read it yet, I encourage you to do so. It's a wonderful book. It's a short story, and it's meant to be read all at one time in one sitting. And it's this, this wonderful tale, one of my favorites in Scripture. But what I love about it the most is that its central characters are women. It's so refreshing to have women be the central characters in a story, especially in scripture. We so rarely hear about the lives of women. They're usually only mentioned in regards to a man or in relation to a man. So that's so-and-so's wife or daughter or mother. And it's even rarer that we hear about women's friendships in scripture or women's relationships to one another. I was doing some research this week, and I learned that not counting the book of Ruth, there are only eight or maybe nine passages where a woman speaks directly to another woman in Scripture. Eight or nine passages in the whole Bible. And sometimes it's one person talking and the other person doesn't even get to talk back. And of all of those conversations, eight or nine times that women speak to each other, every single one of those times... Can you guess what the subject of the conversation is? It's a man. Every single time. Whether it's a husband or a son or a father, the subject of conversation in those other passages is always a man. Yet here in the tiny book of Ruth, it's only four or five chapters, there are more verses dedicated to conversation between women than the rest of the Bible combined in this tiny little book. Here we have a whole story about the lives of two women. And it's not two rich women. It's two poor, vulnerable women, widows, with little hope and little, help, little hope of redemption. These are women of different ages, and they're women of different ethnic backgrounds, and yet they come together, they bind themselves together, and they use their wits to survive. These two women make a way where there is no way. They're able to save themselves and take initiative because of their total devotion and total trust in one another. But I'm getting way too excited. I'm getting way ahead of the story. So let's back up, and first let's open with a word of prayer before we delve into the story of Ruth. Let's pray. We give you thanks, O oh God of sacred stories, for the witness of Scripture. Through it, you nurture our imaginations, touch our feelings, increase our awareness, and challenge our assumptions. Speak to each of us, me included, in this time. Speak to us all and grant that by the power of your Holy Spirit, we may be hearers and doers of your word. In Christ's name, amen. As I said, the book of Ruth is meant to be told in one sitting, all at one time. 
So it's difficult to understand this passage that Joan read without understanding the whole story. Like any good story, the book of Ruth begins basically with once upon a time. It goes on to say, a long time ago, back when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land of Israel. And it was, the famine was so bad that some families had to move. There was a man named Elimelech, and he had a wife and two sons. His wife was Naomi, and his two sons, I don't remember their names. They're not that important to the story. <laughs> but they, they ha the famine is so bad that this family has to move. And they moved to the land of Moab. So fortunately, Moab isn't too far away. It's just on the other side of the Dead Sea, uh, not that far right east of the Dead Sea. But moving to Moab wouldn't be like moving from Oahu to Maui. It would have been really different because Moab was an enemy of Israel. Israelite myth said that the Moabites descended from Lot's descendants, from, from Lot's descendants that came from the incestuous relationship he had with his daughter. And in story after story in the Old Testament, the Moabites lead the Israelites away from God into idolatry. And sometimes they even, they've cursed the people of Israel. They've called down curses from their own gods on the people of Israel. So for them to go to Moab is really risky, and it would have been frowned upon. But desperate times call for desperate measures. They need to survive. They need to eat. So they end up in Moab. There, Naomi's two sons, two nameless sons, <laughs> they marry Moabite women, Orpah and Ruth. Intermarriage wasn't permitted in Israelite law, and marrying Moabite women especially, eek, was not good. So the ancient hearers of this story wouldn't have been surprised at this family's poor fortune. They've moved to Moab, they've broken the law by intermarrying with Moabites. And within 10 years, all three men die. First, Elimelech, and then the two sons. And they leave no children and no male heirs. So we have three women left in this household. Three survivors, three widows, from three different families, in two different countries. All of the systems in the world of men have failed this family. Naomi is now the head of the household, albeit a, a powerless one. And she's particularly displaced and bereft by this whole situation. She knows that she cannot survive in Moab. So they pack up and they go to return to Bethlehem. They set out. But it seems that on the road, she starts to have second, she second guesses herself. She wonders if it's really the right thing for her to do to bring Orpah and Ruth with her. See, in Naomi's eyes, her life is over. Her future is empty. She has no chance, really, of marriage. She cannot bear any more children to save her. She is doomed to a life of begging perhaps a life of prostitution. She doesn't want her daughters-in-law to be stuck with this future as well. After all, they have family in Moab that they can go back to, right? Family who will care for them. Perhaps they can even remarry and have children and live normal, happy lives. So she makes a decision out of love a decision which is not in her own best interest, but in the interest of her daughters-in-law. And she turns to them, she blesses them and thanks them for their, for their kindness to her, and she tells them to leave her, to return home. At first, they refuse. They don't want to leave their mother-in-law, abandon her, this woman with whom they've spent so much time and been through so much. But again, she insists that they go. So eventually, Orpah weeps, and she goes. She goes home. And there's no shame in her doing that. She does what is expected and what is appropriate. Yet Ruth remains 
That's where our scripture comes in. Naomi again tells Ruth, go back to your family and to your gods. Follow your sister-in-law. Go back. But Ruth refuses. I'll read again what she says this time from the message translation. She says, don't force me to leave you. Don't make me go home. Where you go, I will go. And where you live, I'll live. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And that's where I'll be buried. So help me God. Not even death itself is going to come between us. This is much more than a declaration of devotion. It's a commitment, a covenant. In fact, in the translation that Joan read, it says, may God do so to me and even more if she backs out of this. This is an oath formula that's common in the Old Testament. She's making a formal promise, commitment to Naomi. This is far beyond anything that could be expected of Ruth. It's truly extraordinary behavior. She promises lifelong faithfulness, support, and care to this bitter old woman who cannot see a way out. And unlike Naomi, Ruth doesn't rehearse the past or speculate about the future. She doesn't have anything to say about marriage possibilities for the future. She doesn't have a grand plan to get them out of this. She doesn't promise survival. She can't promise survival. The only thing that she can promise is presence. She promises to be with Naomi, regardless of what comes. You can see why this scripture is read so often at weddings. How many of you have heard this read at a wedding before? Yeah, it speaks of that um, till in good times and bad, in sickness and in health, till death do us part, right? Later in the story, the characters are reflecting back on this decision that Ruth makes to stay with Naomi. And there's a Hebrew word that they use to describe this, to describe Ruth's behavior. The word is chesed. Thank you. <laughs> Say it with me, chesed. You really got to get the phlegm going to make it effective. Chesed. <laughs> Chesed is a word that's difficult to translate into English because of the depth of its meaning. It's loving kindness. It's a steadfast love, a loving bond between people or between God and people that's marked by kindness. It's loyalty given out of total care and love for the other. One scholar said, chesed is love in action. It's devotion, unconditional tenderness, and true selflessness. Chesed is most often used to describe not people, but God. The way that God relates to God's people, the way that God cares for God's people. Lamentation says, the chesed of God never ceases. God's mercies never come to an end. Chesed is of God. It is a divine trait, a trait that comes from God. Once in a while in Scripture, though, a person acts selflessly and lovingly enough to have their actions described as chesed. And here it is in the story of Ruth. You can imagine the surprise of the ancient hearers of this story when they hear that it is a Moabite woman who is described as acting with chesed toward an Israelite widow. Ruth shows this kind of chesed that can transform the people and the world around her. And sure enough, it's her chesed that begins to turn the tides of this story. As she continues to faithfully love and care for Naomi, working for her good each and every day, her chesed begins to transform Naomi's heart. Naomi begins to move past her bitterness, and she can suddenly begin to see the possibility of a future for herself and for Ruth. Ruth's chesed helps her to see the good 
and the potential that still exists in her world, in the world that Ruth is creating for them. And so with this change of heart, the two begin to work together. And they begin to develop a trust that is built around mutual chesed. The story of Ruth and Naomi has a happily ever after. But I'm not going to tell you what it is. And I'm not going to tell you how they get there. Because I really want you to read it. I want you to read it. (laughs) But the point is that chesed... That steadfast love and faithful commitment, that is what makes the difference in their story. It is the hallmark of their tale. And it is in Ruth's chesed that we see God's chesed. It's in her chesed that we see God's action for good in the story. See, God doesn't overtly act in the story. God doesn't part the seas and God doesn't speak to them. In fact, it seems that God is absent in the story. Naomi says God is absent in the story. But God wasn't. God was present with Naomi. God was present with Naomi in the form of Ruth. God was working through one of God's people, as God so often does. I think that's what makes this story so meaningful for me, so relatable for me. In the darkest times of my life, or the hardest times, I have never had God show up in a burning bush. Have you? Anyone? A burning bush. When I was deciding which college to go to or whether or not I should move to Hawaii, I never had a pillar of fire and cloud appear before me and direct my way. I'm still waiting for that day, praying for it. And I've never heard God's voice. I know some that have, but God has never spoken to me. But I have most certainly felt God's chesed for me. God's chesed has been brought to expression for me through the chesed of other people. Through people who acted with selfless love on my behalf. That is how God works in my life. How about you? Can you think of a time when someone embodied God's steadfast, loving kindness for you? Can you think of a moment where someone did that for you? Someone was that for you? Reverend Catherine Williams writes that chesed is not just at the heart of God's relationship with us, but is also, it is also at the heart of our discipleship today. She calls this the way that God is at work in unspectacular ways. Chesed is the way that God is at work in unspectacular ways. It is through us, through each of us just being there, being present and caring when the need arises. God's chesed is embodied by the people of God when we devote ourselves to not letting others fall through the cracks. We act with chesed when we caretake for our loved ones, when we give of our time and of ourselves for the well-being of others. We act with chesed when we sit as a silent, loving presence with someone who just doesn't have the words to say. And we act with chesed when we listen to the same story again and again because it makes someone's heart so happy to tell it. We act with chesed when we adopt a child or a pet or when we foster a child. And we act with chesed when we stand in solidarity with native peoples who are defending their sacred lands. And we act with chesed when we fight for migrants whose basic human rights are being denied. And we act with chesed when we provide a safe space for someone to just come and be, to rest, a place where no one can harm with words or with actions.
My friends, this is the call of the church, to live with chesed. It is the call of humanity to treat one another with loving kindness. And Naomi's life depended on Ruth acting with chesed. She had no one else. And if Ruth had chosen a different path, Naomi's story would have ended really differently. I believe that there are lives that depend on us doing the same. That there are those among us and those who aren't among us whose very lives depend on our loving action, on our chesed. There are people that have no one else. God has put us in their lives so that we can be the ones that act with chesed. And if we do, we too can transform the lives and the hearts and the world around us. Let us courageously live into that call. Amen.